I tell people, I have probably written code with like the Python date functions like for the past 20 years, but I can never remember exactly what they do. To be able to simply type in the chat GPT, hey, I'm trying to extract date from, you know, a string that looks like this. And it instantly gives me that answer so that I'm not fishing through eight stack overflow posts about doing that. I think that kind of productivity is uh, is super real. But I think the value that companies can get out of AI, which basically comes from understanding language, understanding knowledge, making it easier for us to talk and query it, um, I think that is a breakthrough. Um, and I would definitely uh, encourage every CIO, every CDO uh, to think about how can they make existing things that they do that are tedious um, or difficult more efficient? Hi, Strida. Great to have you on the show. Excited to be on the show with you, Richie. Excellent. Um, I'd love to have uh, a bit of context on Snowflake. So your, fa- your flagship product is a data cloud. So what makes this different to a data warehouse? Well... Data is at the center of most enterprises. You know, that's what they run on day in and uh, day day out. Um, It is uh, one thing to have a warehouse to store the data, but of course you want to do stuff with it, whether it is transforming it or being able to run machine learning on top of it or build applications on top or have your partners bring their data to you so you have that context in one place, Um, or others bring applications also, you begin to get the picture. You know, uh, Snowflake started um, as the place for all data 10 plus years ago, Um, but over time, this data has so much gravity that things like collaboration, applications, very different kinds of things that you can do with data all begin to be part of the core offering from us and from our partners. That's what we mean when we talk about um, Snowflake being a data cloud. Okay, so um, you can't just have just the the data warehouse where things are stored, you need that application sort of layer and all these other bits on top of it. So I'd love to discuss all these things uh, more in detail. Before we get to that, uh, can you just tell us a bit, tell me a bit about um, what sort of organizations are using Snowflake? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> Much of the Fortune 1000, Fortune, you know, the, the world, the Enterprise 2000, um, they are all using uh, Snowflake. Um, these include very large companies like uh, Fidelity across, you know, across the board, across different industries. I would say that um, finance, healthcare, media are some of our strong suits, but it spans the spectrum. Anybody that basically um, wants an authoritative view of data gravitates towards Snowflake um, because they realize um, that our things like our unique architecture that offers for very flexible and separated compute and storage, um, and also um, our business model, um, which is consumption-based, you only pay for what you consume, um, makes for a great addition uh, to the IT space that pretty much every organization has Uh, So we have broad adoption by a lot of people and uh, they love us because, um, you know, we just work out of the box, require very, very low uh, maintenance um, and uh, are very cost efficient for the value that we bring to these enterprises. Okay. Uh, So yeah, low maintenance and cost efficient sound like uh, good things. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about um, how uh, generative AI has changed things. Obviously, that's been the big story of this last year. So do you think the rise of generative AI has changed executive attitudes to data? I think smart executives have always known that having their data story in a good place um, just made their job easier. Um, If you look at uh, some of our customers, Fidelity, for example, and they're open about the fact that we are like the data layer um, for how they run their, uh, their business. Um, this is because they have a number of operational systems for doing things like you can, if you trade stocks on Fidelity, it goes to an operational system. Um, but those systems um, are not really meant for visibility, not really meant for insight. And so they collect all of the data into, into Snowflake, also have their partners bring that data um, to the same platform so that they have the 360 degree view of it. I would say data to a certain extent for enterprises has been an ongoing priority. Um, But to me, 
um, what really, really excites everybody, including me, including your mom, um, and the CEOs about generative AI is they all go like, wait, you mean I can talk to a computer in like plain language and it's actually going to understand um, what I'm saying? I think it's that that people are excited by. Uh, CEOs know, uh, for example, that they have needed a bunch of analysts, uh, you know, a bunch of different tools like dashboards and visualization tools and BI tools in order to look at the data. I think people are super excited by the prospect of just better human to data communication. And that's the same attitude that we have at Snowflake. Um, we think, oh wait, um, you mean we can create a chat bot or a specific data set and you can just ask questions in English um, and it'll do a good job of giving you answers. And it, if it can't give you an answer, it'll just say like, no, I can't do that. Um, you know, We are very excited by being able to provide things like that. But I would say the core thing that all of us um, are and should be excited about um, is this idea that natural language, as opposed to strange buttons and text boxes that you have to enter data into, and magical incantations from software engineers and analysts, is getting replaced by ordinary language. Um, I think that's the real power of language models. Of course, they can do a lot more, but to me, just that, if we can realize the value of that, is going to be a big, big deal for enterprises. Uh, yeah, certainly the idea of having a natural language interface is um, much more uh, well intuitive for many people, I think. Um, can you tell me how this um, this idea uh, translates to a competitive advantage for businesses? Um, well, uh, you know, for Snowflake, for example, um, uh, the idea of uh, language models and, uh, and, and AI is a great add-on, um, but the core advantage that we have is that thousands of enterprises trust us with their data. Um, they bring all of the data about their businesses to their Snowflake instance. Um, they set up different kinds of extraction pipelines, different kinds of visualization pipelines, um, and uh, all of that is there. And what AI now does is it creates this additional value on top where this data is more easily accessible um, where insights are easier uh, to, uh, to, to get at. And so in that sense, I see AI as a major accelerant um, for traditional enterprise software. Now, there are lots of new applications that is also going to be disruption. Um, there are lots of new applications that are going to come up that were basically like unimagined and unimaginable, meaning um, in 2001 and two, you know, by that time, there were cell phones, like, you know, you and I probably used them. Um, and I remember like this brick of a phone that I had back when I was working at Bell Labs, it would like, be a pound. Um, but uh, uh, we could never really imagine Uber because a whole bunch of other things needed to come together. Similarly, I think AI is going to throw off a whole new class of applications, everything from image generation to video generation. I don't know about you, but I don't really use memes anymore. I go to chat GPT, write up a little description of, I'll send you one after our podcast of, uh, hey, I'm talking with Richie about data, make me a little cartoon, uh, saying something funny about it, and out comes the school cart. I think those kinds of applications will also be there. Um, I think it will cause disruption in the media sphere. Um, but I think for core enterprises, um, I think the the nimble ones especially will adopt AI and use that as an accelerant for their core offering. Absolutely, that's what we're doing at Snowflake. That's really interesting. Like, I hadn't really thought of like the meme industry being the, the thing that's been disrupted. <laughs> it's like all the millennials, it's like, no, that's it. No AI for, no AI for me. <laughs> um, all right, cool. Uh, I don't know whether you have any more examples of like things, like do any of your have any of your sort of early adopter customers started creating some of these new applications you've been talking about? Oh, totally. Um, so the kinds of applications that people are super excited by um, is just more fluid interaction um, with existing stuff. Um, so for example, uh, the first project that my team launched, um, you know, a uh, little side story, um, I started a search engine called uh, Neva uh, among the, uh, the first uh, AI-powered search engines on the planet. Um, and so Snowflake acquired us in May last year. Um, and so we are experts in like search and in AI. 
uh, hot ingredients right now. And but the first application that we launched was really just like conversational marketplace search. Snowflake has a marketplace where you can buy data sets, where you can buy applications. And we're like, ah, oh, you should be able to type in anything into that, not just like a three word query. You can type in like a couple of sentences into it and we'll generate the right answers for you. Um, therein lies a kernel of an idea. Um, a lot of the work that we do day to day is search over specialized corpuses. Um, meaning we search for help when they're using a particular product. Um, we will search like in Drive for specific documents, um, on and on and on. And uh, um, the, like I would say, like the, the prototypical application um, for AI is to take the data that is relevant to a particular context um, and uh, uh, put it into some sort of search index. You can use a vector index. You can use like what's called an IR, an information retrieval index, or combine the two as you are doing at uh, at Snowflake. Um, so you search for that information. You take the output of the search, feed it into a language model, and ask it to generate a fluid um, sort of interactive chatbot. Now we are chatting with a data corpus. Um, that's like the earliest application um, that our customers are uh, developing. And Snowflake makes it easy. Just yesterday, I was like, ah, I want to build an end-to-end -end application using Streamlit, which is a rapid prototyping environment. And in like an hour, I took a CNN news data set, stuck it into Snowflake, um, in, you know, put up a vector index on it, um, and then used uh, Streamlit and a language model to be like, you know, you can search over this. You can interact with this corpus. Um, now, I'm not the best programmer in the world. Those days are long gone but I was able to do this, as I said, in less than an hour. That's the power that we bring. And there are also other applications, uh, something that we call Snowpilot, which is a co-pilot that helps you write SQL. Lots of people are trying it out. We have another project that uses language models um, in order to extract structured information, say from things like contracts. You know, companies sign lots of contracts, there are all kinds of magical numbers in these contracts. What's the rep share, what's the, you know, what's the penalty if something is out of SLA? Um, they forget about these contracts and don't really know what goes into them, but people want to extract that structured information. So we have a project called Doc AI um, that helps people extract structured information from unstructured documents, puts it into a table um, so that you can run classical analysis using SQL on top of that. Um, we now have, I think, over 100 customers that are using it. Um, and it's in private preview and soon headed to public preview so they can deploy it in production. Hopefully this gives you a flavor of the kinds of things. Um, but I would say like table stakes application, number one is um, think customer support, think document search. How can we do this much better? How can we do it a lot more interactively? Uh, and then going all the way up to, ooh, let's create a multimodal model that can look through PDFs and extract structured information and there's a whole lot in between. That's pretty amazing that um, there are like so many different applications there. And you mentioned that even with some sort of fairly basic uh, programming skills, you could build something that actually added value in an hour. Um, yeah, that's the dream. Um, all right, I'd like to get into some of these applications in a bit more detail. So uh, maybe we'll start with search since that's your, your forte. Now, I speak to an awful lot of chief data officers and the one thing, every single one of the complaints that is, the data across their organization is stuck in silos. They have all this data. No one really knows where it is. They can't access it. Um, it feels like AI um, and your and search is going to help with this. Can you talk me um, through how it's going to help? 100%. So, you know, some of our larger deployments um, of Snowflake have a 100,000 tables. Um, that's nutty. If you're like, oh, I want information about this specific topic. Where should I look? Um, it's really, really hard. Usually all of these devolve into a giant Slack channel in which you're like, hey, I'd like information about this project. Like, does somebody know something? Um, it sort of comes down to it. Um, and tools like Google don't really help because they don't have the kind of deep context uh, into specific data sets, what are the semantics of it, and, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, so we have an, at Snowflake, we have an ambitious effort called Horizon, um, which basically makes sharing, creating of shares, uh, sharing data within an enterprise, just like a whole lot easier. You can attach, you know, we help you figure out semantics. We help you figure out, for example, um, is this column email addresses? Is this column other kind of PII? 
Um, of course, you can also put information about tables, about schemas, um, and uh, um, we have this effort to make it really easy for you to search through the data sets, again, in natural language um, and, uh, uh, and get to the data. Of course, you know, access control is a big, big deal and no company um, is going to say, uh, in the name of making data easily visible, I'm going to make everything visible. You know, that is also a disaster. Um, but what we're doing are clever techniques um, by which you can search over the metadata and figure out, who there is this data set but I actually don't have access to it. How do I request the owner of the data to provide me with access because my, uh, my request is a legitimate request? So we think about the life cycle of data discovery um, and then how that subsequently drives data sharing. Um, and I think this is the kind of stuff that is going to be helping a whole lot. And then other aspects of AI that we will get into um, then will make it easy uh, for people to be able to quickly query the data, um, part of um, the objective of Snowpilot, the co-pilot effort within Snowflake, um, is that it should be able to use things like the previous queries, the context from the experts on any particular schema to help future people write SQL in an easier fashion. Um, but it all starts um, with having the data in the right place, having metadata attached to it, and making it super easy to discover um, and share data in a controlled way. And that's what we're doing with Horizon. That's really interesting, the idea that even if a data set needs to be kept private, you can still make the metadata public or at least slightly more visible across your organization. The metadata searchable within the enterprise. In other words, you can separate out the two. Searching over the, the privilege to search over metadata is different from the privilege to actually be able to run stuff on it. Um, and uh, Again, you know, we are in the business of providing data owners, enterprises, our customers with the right tools. Um, we think this is an interesting differential. Um, by the way, we obsess about these details. Um, we even have something called a future grant, um, where we basically say, you know, um, I want to give access to this particular schema, um, let's say about like revenue data from Europe uh, to Richie. Um, but I also want to give the same access for all future tables that I'm going to create in the schema because these things are living, breathing things. And, you know, as new things come on, you want to keep that access. Again, that's a choice that um, uh, business owners can make. Okay. So data access management is one of those things where it feels like it's no, one I'd, no one's idea of a fun time. So maybe you don't want all this stuff automated so people aren't um, having to mess about with, with some of the technical details. Yeah, I think, but it's it's a matter of providing the right level of abstraction. Um, you know, just saying everything is open is clearly not going to work. On the other hand, people are realizing that saying everything is closed doesn't really work either. So it becomes a question of what's the right level of abstraction that you offer uh, to the administrators, to the business data owners, uh, so that they can responsibly manage how data is shared. Uh, I always think of process as like, you know, it should be just enough, not too much friction, but not too little, you know, friction, everything is open either. You know, that's like the magical Goldilocks situation that uh, uh, we try to get our customers into. So you mentioned before about um, using uh, semantic search and these natural language interfaces to make all this sort of work. So this has been hyped up as a technology that's going to be like much better than keyword search and is going to sort of solve a lot of our enterprise search problems. I'm wondering how realistic is that? Like, are we at a point where all of our enterprise search problems are, are solved now or is there still work to be done? Oh, I mean, uh, look, <laughs> the basic problem is that, uh, you know, there are a ton of applications used in the enterprise, like hundreds. Um, you know, in our, uh, we didn't realize it, at Neva, we were a 50-person company, you know, around for only four years. Uh, and then we got bought by Snowflake. We had to make like a list of all of the software that we used and uh, what data that there is. And that list kept going and going and going. And uh, all of these are little silos. Um, so I think that uh, um, getting all the data together um, in a queryable form is very much an open project. I don't think that is, uh, you know, that is, that is done. 
Um, and things like access control. Every application, remember, not only has data, but has rules for who can access data. And the rules um, are typically also disjointed. Um, and uh, so we have a number of connectors for bringing in data from different kinds of applications like Salesforce uh, into Snowflake. Uh, so it really becomes more of a second brain um, for the enterprise where all of this data sits, um, you know, sits in there. Um, and only after you have the data does semantic search come into play um, and can get you the right data. Uh, you know, people are big fans of uh, what's called vector indexing. Uh, it's an evolution of the same language model, AI technology, really. Um, what it does is it takes your English query um, and creates an embedding out of it um, and then looks for documents that are roughly in the same space. Um, the problem with uh, vector search is that uh, sometimes it lacks precision. Um, it turns out even if you type in 20 words, there are two or three of those words that really matter a lot. Um, and so you need to make sure that documents that you return have those words. Uh, so I would say this is an this is a rapidly evolving field. Um, you know there is excitement because of vector indexing because it can do some pretty magical stuff. Uh, but you also need to combine that with more traditional what are called IR information retrieval techniques of the kind that were pioneered by you know by by Google. Um, it is it is getting better, um, but it's not a you know press this button or sign this agreement and everything is done kind of situation. There's work to do. Okay. It does sound like a lot of the success then um, is really based on like the, the quality of the data and how well you're managing it and how well you're doing, you're working with metadata. That's right. That's right. And how you, you know, how you bring it in, you know, let's face it, if, you, if, if a CIO is using 300 applications, they're not going to say, I need a copy of like each of the 300 applications somewhere else or I need to figure out how to provide API access. These app applications often have terrible APIs for accessing the data in them because it's not really in their interest to provide you with the API. They're like, yeah, 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 come to our application using our, uh, you know, you, using our website. And so it is, it's, it's work. It's tricky. There's, it's not a gimmick. Okay. And it seems like even beyond the tooling there, just for data quality, you need to worry about uh, processes and, um, your organizational culture. Um, I don't know whether you have any advice on how you might improve your culture to improve um, the data quality and management. You know, I think a, a, um, a culture of thoughtful inquiry um, where you're like, uh, you know, let's, let's use data wherever it is feasible. Um, let's look at the biggest needs that, uh, you know, that we have um, and make sure that we have the data to support it, which will, which will drive us that of uh, priorities for the organization. Every organization has, and you know this, all of us have uh, more things to do than we can realistically get done. Um, and uh, so prioritization of what are the most important sources, um, how do we make sure that we have a handle on those, um, and then how do we provide visibility? Um, I would say like, like prioritization uh, and, a, um, and a mentality of really having data in a good place for the things that matter. Like, how much revenue are you making? You better have good data on that. How much are you spending? You better have good data on that. It's like start taking a top-down approach like that and then prioritizing the biggest places where you, where you need to uh, invest in getting data, invest in insights on the data um, is what I think is important. Um, you know, too many teams, too many companies will start us you know, start these mega digital transformation projects. We are going to be a digital only, everything in one place sort of company. Um, those projects usually don't really succeed um, because they try to attempt, I mean, they, they basically try to do too much. Um, so I think prioritization, um, using tools that uh, a company like Snowflake provides, we not only provide uh, the data platform, but we also provide things like connectors um, thoughtfully um, and prioritizing the right data sources so that they can be they can be queried and insight can, insight can be built on top of them. Um, I think there's there's no real substitute for that. There's not a silver bullet that is going to solve data um, visibility problems in any complex enterprise. Life is just too complicated. I do think uh, you made a very good point there that yeah, most businesses should probably know how much money they're making, how much money they're they're spending, and just starting with that real high value. Um, 
uh, track data, track. yeah, is going to be useful. All right. Um, so I'd like to go back to applications. One thing that you were talking about earlier was SQL generation. So uh, this is like one of the big promises of generative AI. You can, instead of writing SQL, you can just write a natural language query. Uh, can you tell me a bit about how that works in Snowflake? Yeah, I mean, first of all, um, you know, let me start out by saying that SQL generation on complicated schemas with poor metadata is not a solved problem. Don't let anyone convince you um, that a language model is going to look at a horribly designed schema and like magically help you be proficient with this is like, you know, that's just not going, that is just not where the tech is. Um, uh, however, um, if columns have good names, um, if there is additional metadata available on tables, if there are things like views, for example, um, that capture the essence of, um, you know, the data that is sitting in a schema, then language models indeed can help a whole lot. They can take all of this context um, the metadata about tables, the metadata about columns, the metadata about value distribution in the columns, um, say you have access to previous queries that have been run against a schema and people have written comments on those queries, they can take all of that context um, and use them as aids um, in generating SQL. That's what we do with Snowpilot. Um, because it's Snowflake, we have access to everything that I just said. Um, we can bring all of that smarts present it in a clever way to the language model and, and tell them, and tell the language model, these are the tables you're dealing with. This is how they're normally joined. And this is the question that the user has. Um, can you think through the process of writing a piece of SQL for that? You know, in situations like that, um, the models do much, much, uh, you know, much better um, and are able to generate SQL for some pretty difficult um, problems. And that's what we're doing at Snowflake. Um, so we take state-of-the-art models, whether it's a Llama 2 or a Mistral, um, and uh, we have a pretty large team, several hundred engineers um, that are working on things like fine-tuning these models to do better SQL. So we do a lot of work in like in the in the data prep, um, and uh, we're also looking into things like can we um, fine-tune models with um, uh, customer-specific information but give them a copy so that their data is not mixed in with anyone else's. And can these models be much better at generating SQL for those customers because it has this additional um, additional content. Um, so we have this team that is, um, that's basically working on things like fine-tuning models for, uh, for, for SQL generation. As I said, we have an effort that looks uh, into understanding the metadata behind schemas, and we combine both of these into the co-pilot experience on Snowflake, um, which unsurprisingly is like this pane on the right um, where you type in a, you know, a query in English um, and it's going to generate a, a piece of SQL for you. You look at it, make sure that it is fine, um, and then you can click hit, like, hit run and uh, the query runs in the worksheet. The next thing that we are working on is um, basically an, an API, a programmatic version of Copilot so that our customers can now build applications. The idea is that you point this API to a, uh, to a schema um, and embed the API into a tool um, where a user now is able to ask questions. And underneath, the model generates the SQL, runs the SQL, and returns the result back to the user. Um, that's like the next thing that, uh, um, that, that we are working on. Um, but hopefully this gives you an idea of like, what are the ingredients of uh, Snowpilot um, and how is it being deployed in practice and where is it going to go relatively um, relatively soon? The thing that I'll stress here is that this is very much a software engineering problem. Just like GitHub Copilot uses models to help you write code, but really there's a lot of clever software engineering that goes into presenting the right context for the model so that it can do a great job. There's no like magic answer of, uh, Hey, I have a couple of million lines of code. Uh, language model help me do you know do my thing. That's 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 fiction. It does sound very interesting that a lot of what you're doing seems to be prompt engineering. So you're basically depriving all that extra context in order to write good SQL sort of in the background. So the user says, "Well, this is my business problem," and then you provide all that sort of background data. 
it's a, it's actually multiple things. It is uh, it is fine tuning, um, which is where you take a model that is capable of doing a lot uh, and give it teach it a bunch of additional context. So, for example, out of the box, none of these models are great at Snowflake SQL, our our sort of variant dialect of SQL, and so that's what you fine tune. Um, on the other hand, you also want to present very specific context, um, and uh, it's more than uh, you know, I would say like when, when you say prompt engineering, um, I think of that as like a kid hacking around in chat GPT. Um, these are more software engineering systems that carefully construct what goes into a model, how many calls get made um, and, and so on in order to solve a business problem. It's the difference between somebody writing a line, one line of Python uh, and getting something done versus, uh, you know, uh, versus a team that is going to write like a Python package that is going to be used by thousands and thousands of people. That's what I mean by it's real software engineering. Yeah, yeah, like that. Putting the, focusing on the engineering side of things. Okay, uh, all right. Um, so one thing you mentioned was that um, once you get to these big enterprise schemas and if there's like poorly labeled data, then that's where problems start to occur. I'm wondering if, do people need to start designing databases differently in order to make this work? Like, do you need to have smaller schemas or do you need to focus more on column names and metadata and things like that in order to get good SQL generation? It's a great question. Uh, the good news is that uh, uh, BI tools have already been teaching enterprises uh, to create these semantic layers. Um, what language models struggle to do uh, today uh, BI tools have been struggling with this for the past 20 years. Uh, and so there are a ton of, unfortunately, it's not really standardized. You know, DBT has its semantic layer, so does Power BI, or Thoughtspot, or Looker. Um, and so there are variants of these things. Uh, so the work uh, that is needed to get a schema to a place, a uh, better language model will have a better, you know, is, is able to do a better job with it, is similar uh, to the work that uh, enterprises do in order to get their data ready for BI tools. And we are actively looking at uh, if an enterprise already has this data, can we just, can you know, can we just use it? Um, but I would overall, to answer your question, I would say like data cleanliness um, and uh, making sure that there are not like eight date columns um, and uh, you need an archeologist uh, to figure out which one to use for a particular giant. That's just like good software engineering practice. Um, I, when I write code, for example, I write it from the perspective of A, this code is going to live forever. B, I'm going to come back to it three months from now and not remember a thing about what I did because it's not the kind of stuff that stays in your brain forever. And so having that mentality and really like saying, you know, things should be uh, named appropriately um is uh is 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 very important absolutely i've certainly been <laughs> i love the name next gen by the way um whenever people start like a new software module um they will call it like you know next gen foobar um and six months will go by and you're like wait what 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 this has been production <laughs> for six months what do you mean this is next gen because a new person that shows up this is that's the only thing that they know yeah, in some points it's last gen, but uh, yeah, badly named. <laughs> cool. Um, all right, so uh, yeah, I can certainly see how um, being able to like maintain code is going to be incredibly important. So naming things uh, is very useful. Um, I'm curious as to how people use these AI features in practice. Is it people um, using natural language to write all their um, to do all their queries then, or the people who are just like, I don't want this. I just want to write SQL. Is there a mix? Uh, what do you users do? Um, so I would say uh, it spans a spectrum. Um, we wanted the power of language models to be available to all of our users, including our analysts. Um, and we don't think of, uh, say, Copilot as like a replacement for uh, a business analyst. Um, it's going to make them more efficient. It's going to make some of their more mundane tasks a little bit easier. Um, but there's more. Um, so when we design Snowflake Cortex, which is the AI layer that ships with every Snowflake deployment, um, we, first of all, wanted to make it super easy to use. So we, in fact, expose Cortex as a set of SQL functions. 
So for example, if you wanted to do summarization on a text column that is in a snowflake table, that is as simple as making a SQL call um, to this summarize function. Um, and you pick the model that you want to send this text to, um, and it'll take your instructions and generate a summary for you. And the list sort of goes on and on. We also expose um, what we call a, a complete, which is basically you can think of it as, you know, assembling a prompt and sending it to a language model. Um, but you can do this in SQL. This prototype that I was telling you about, um, the new search prototype, um, basically does that. It assembles a prompt um, in SQL and sends it to the language model. So that's like stop number one, which is existing analysts are now able to use the power of language models to do sentiment detection, to do translation, to do summarization, um, to do structured data extraction from text. All of those things just come out of the box um, in Snowflake, you know, courtesy of Snowflake Cortex. Um, but we also design these in a way um, that you can now begin to build applications like chatbots on top of it. By combining semantic search with a language model, as I said, that's the ingredient for a chatbot. You can put all the documents for a particular topic into a Snowflake table, and then you can create a chatbot by which you can just have a conversation about those, um, um, about those documents. Um, and, but we also expose our most complex model, like the SQL generation model, to our customers so that if they say, no, 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 I do not want to call SQL functions. I don't want to use like your easy to build chatbot. I want to build something amazing myself. I'm, I have the people that are, you know, that can do the software engine. We make that possible as well using something called container services, which is our extensibility framework. Um, our customers can fine tune models themselves, deploy them in container services, and then write applications that talk to these deployed models. Um, but you get the idea, which is language models at every layer. We don't try to lock our customers into one way of doing things. We expose these at every layer so that they can mix and match what it is that they want to do. Um, you know, my mantra is uh, simple things should be simple, complex things should be possible. And that's really what Snowflake Cortex and container services um, are about. I really like that there's a sort of gradual um, evolution. I've, you, you mentioned there's a spectrum, so you can start with just doing simple things and like everything is just generated in natural language. And then if you've got more technical skills, you can build up to doing uh, things in, in Snowflake SQL. That's right. That's right. That's right. Excellent. And uh, so you mentioned like often this is going to be te like whole data teams uh, being involved or maybe even software developers. So it does seem like working with data is very much um, a team sport these days. So um, can you talk about um, how you see your customers doing collaboration on some of these tasks? Um, you mean within, within their teams or with us? Uh, yeah, so uh, within teams, and, and I guess even like in organizations, um, often working with data and AI tends to be um, several teams involved in things. So do you have any advice on effective collaboration techniques? I mean, I think the, the first thing that uh, I talked about when it came to collaborating was how do you make sure that uh, uh, you know silos are eliminated and data duplication is a thing of the past? Um, this is where Horizon and all of the efforts that you're doing around collaboration comes into play, which is uh, you know don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, again, you know this. Uh, most big enterprises have like you know uh, three implementations for every project or like things repeated over and over again simply because communication is not all that effective. So at a very basic level, we want to make sure that uh, you know, we make it super easy for people to leverage the work of their colleagues um, and, uh, and, and use the data. Um, and then when you, you know, when, when you go up one step from there uh, to let's build, uh, let's build applications, um, that is very much a collaborative team sport. Um, then you need one person um, that knows the data. You're probably more of an analyst uh, type person. Um, but if you're building a chatbot, for example, you do want somebody that knows a little bit about you know, prompt engineering and what language models do um, and, uh, and, and so on. Um, and then you also need governance on these things. Um, so you sort of have, do have to get the right people together 
in order to do these projects. Um, but uh, part of our design with Cortex was simple things, like an analyst being able to use a language model to do interesting things within like the ambit of what they do day to day, that should be much easier. Similarly, an analyst that sort of knows data that is looking at a new schema, uh, making them productive quickly, um, uh, you know, with Snowpilot, uh, is something that sort of happens naturally. Um, I think this does not take away from the need to bring people together um, with different skills in order to make a project succeed. Uh, and in Snowpilot, for example, uh, we have people that are search infrastructure engineers. Um, we have people um, that know like data uh, really, really well. We have language model experts that are doing things like fine tuning. We also have UX engineers because you need to actually create a product um, that people love, that is easy to interact with. Um, and so, and then obviously you need like product managers and designers um, in order to be able to get something like that uh, done. Snowpilot is a complicated project, but like you get the idea, you do need to bring people together um, and they need to have the right skills in order to get, uh, in order to get things, like meaningful things done. Okay, yeah, so really it's about uh, make sure that everyone's uh, got access to the right information and uh, um, they're being able to work at the sort of the appropriate level of uh, technical skills uh, for them. That's right, that's right, that's right. And this is also where like leads and managers are really important in this process. Uh, they have to have a mental idea of like, this is what it takes to be successful with a project like this. These are the skills that need to be there. Sometimes it's small teams, you know, of two people, sometimes it's four people. Uh, but just like thinking through that um, and assembling these teams is an essential ingredient for success. All right. So I'd like to step away from uh, the Snowflake talk now. So you also have uh, another job as a partner at Greylock. I'm a venture partner. It's a part-time role. Yeah. Excellent. Because, uh, you know, you've got all that free time for an extra job. Uh, okay. So um, I'd like to know what uh, data and AI companies you are most excited about right now. Yeah, so um, uh, at Greylock, we've invested in several what we call foundation model companies. These are, I, you know, these are, we think, the infrastructure companies that will power the future. Um, this is Mustafa's uh, inflection. Mustafa's, of course, one of the world's, uh, Suleiman uh, is one of the world's renowned AI experts, he used to work at, uh, at, at DeepMind. Um, we also invested in a company called uh, Adept. Um, so those are at, at the at the foundational um, layer, um, but we do think um, that there are a ton um, of enterprise application companies um, that are going to be interesting. Um, we don't think like AI is going to be quite like a magic sauce, as I was saying. You still need to acquire customers. You still need to have that more um, because pretty much everybody knows how to use like GPT three or GPT four on an API call. You know the, the the bar for excellence is is quite a bit higher, um, and we are also excited by some of uh, the newer generative applications. Everything from image generation uh, to I think video generation is uh, is is pretty exciting. I don't know about you, but I used to edit videos when my son used to play tennis. It's a mind-bogglingly like tedious job to do anything. I used to try and make like three minute summaries out of matches that would last like uh, three hours. It's so hard to do. Um, and I think like whether it is video generation or video editing, um, I think there's just a lot of value that they are going to, that they're going to create. Um, I think advertising and marketing, um, are going to be changed in, uh, in, in a pretty big way. Uh, my son, who's also a software engineer, uh, recently showed me this LLM powered application for making experimentation on websites just a whole lot easier. And he's like, here, drop this little piece of JavaScript. We'll run the experiment. We will generate potential variations, run experiments for you. Um, so I think there's like a set of these kinds of products that are going to be AI native um, that uh, are going to have a big impact on both enterprises and consumers. I'm definitely very excited for um, all these sort of generative AI video applications. It just seemed like they've been kind of okay and coming soon for a while now. So yeah, I hope they, they get their spotlight. Um, all right. Uh, so the other thing is that it seems like there has been a lot of money thrown at uh, AI companies just over the last year. Is this something you think is going to continue or do you think it's sort of a bubble that's about to burst? Uh, I think 
people are definitely going to be asking questions um, about uh, about about sort of revenue returns and what is actually uh, going on over uh, over there. Uh, you know, a five percent interest rate environment has a profound influence on startups. Uh, I think it's hard for people to realize uh, that like the difference between zero and 5% interest rates is it's, it's basically infinity. Um, and uh, uh, I think what is going on, I mean, one of the things that happened last year um, when we talk about large amounts of money being thrown at companies is that quite a bit of it, uh, but also investments um, by the CSPs, by the very large platforms, um, and these investments basically turned around into cloud spend. Um, you know, so I don't think of that as like real investment. Um, it's it's like it's like a little bit of, uh, uh, as my colleague Vivek puts it, uh, taking your balance sheet and converting it into 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 revenue. Um, that's what that's what that's what that is. Um, I do think that VCs are cautious about not throwing too much money um, into unknown uh, kind of companies. Um, and uh, I think the time of uh, like 100x revenue valuations are definitely a thing of the past. Um, uh, AI, I think, has perhaps another six to nine months before similar kinds of questions will be asked um, about revenue and revenue growth and, and things like that. So, um, you know, when it comes to our customers, for example, already they are asking us about, hey, how much should I invest? How should I be looking for ROI? Where are we creating value? Um, these are all good, hard questions for people to ask. Um, and honestly, I think like avoiding some of the hype will keep us all in a better place um, because bubbles do not do you know anyone any favors. Absolutely. So uh, it sounds like it's good that uh, there are some hard questions being asked before money's being thrown at it. Of course. Excellent. All right. Uh, money, so... <laughs> mon- money being thrown itself, of course, is a funny phrase, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, all right. So uh, before we wrap up, uh, do you have any final advice for organizations wanting to improve their data management or AI capabilities? Yeah, I think that um, uh, there are pretty solid breakthroughs when it comes to AI and language model. Um, it is not like, um, I think like thoughtfully using the power of language models, um, you know, can make things more efficient. Um, this whole like writing code, like there is a before and an after if you have an assistant. Even having access to chat GPT, um, you know, I tell people I have probably written code with like the Python date functions like for the past 20 years, but I can never remember exactly what they do. To be able to simply type into chat GPT, hey, I'm trying to extract date from, you know, a string that looks like this, and it instantly gives me that answer so that I'm not fishing through eight stack overflow posts about doing that. I think that kind of productivity is uh, is super real. Um, I would say that embracing what these models enable and using a platform like Snowflake to build on top of, um, we take enormous pride in the fact that our AI infrastructure is seamlessly integrated with everything else that's going on in Snowflake. The investments that you have um, in access control just carry over naturally to everything that we provide with AI. Um, I think like having partners like that, um, that are about providing real value and not just hyping up the latest thing um, that, uh, you know, customers can put money into. I think that's an important thing to keep uh, to keep in mind. But I think the value that companies can get out of AI, which basically comes from understanding language, understanding knowledge, making it easier for us to talk and query it. Um, I think that is a breakthrough. Um, and I would definitely... Uh, encourage every CIO, every CDO uh, to think about how can they make existing things that they do that are tedious um, or difficult more efficient. There's a whole bunch of those to go after. Wonderful. All right. Uh, Lots of opportunities there then. Uh, Excellent. So uh, thank you very much for your time, Sridhar. Thank you, Richie. This was a fun, fun, fun conversation. Mm